Fenton is creating this new genre. Um, there had never been a photographer photographing war before this to such a, a degree. Um, he's not taking images of the battle unfolding, but he is taking photographs that interpret and that present and that comment on war. And that is essentially war photography. This photograph is of the main British cemetery on Cathcart Hill. Sophie encourages me to see it through Victorian eyes. In the middle ground, we have a group of officers who are looking down towards Sevastopol. And it's that interesting juxtaposition between active uh, on-duty soldiers who are then standing next to the graveyard where the bodies of their dead comrades are now buried. That is so striking in this particular image. It's a very moving portrait, I think, when you think about that, that, that juxtaposition. This is the most celebrated photograph that Fenton took during the Crimean War, the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Yet there is no fighting here, no dead bodies, just a landscape with cannonballs. This is uh, an extraordinary, almost iconic now, image of, of war. And it shows uh, it's such uh, stillness and silence uh, on the battlefield. We can see a ravine that runs between the British lines and Russian fortifications. And there are cannonballs scattered along the path. Now, there's uh, some controversy over these, this image because there is, in fact, a second image, almost identical, apart from the fact that there are no cannonballs in it. And uh, it's often discussed as um, whether Fenton manipulated his images. And obviously, he either put the cannibals there or he removed them. Um, but I don't think that really matters. Um, but that is the one question every ph photographer wants to know, isn't it? <laughs> Did he move them? <laughs> well, you have to remember that in the 1850s, all photographs would have been staged. Everything was, was deliberate, was carefully prepared, carefully staged, managed. Even the portraits were very thoughtful and, and well prepared. Um, and Fenton is creating a work of art. He's not there to necessarily portray um, a, a realistic, objective view of what's happening. He's trying to do more than that. And when you uh, consider the poetic title as well, which comes from the Psalms, The Valley of the Shadow of Death, it's more than just a record of a battlefield. It's a comment on war. In 1860, Roger Fenton returned to Yorkshire. His brother-in-law was the estate manager at Harewood House, and Fenton was asked to record its recent extension and modernisation. I wonder if coming back from the chaos of war, Roger Fenton found it restful to work in a genre of photography where the Victorian desire for the natural order of things might be satisfied. That of architecture. However, barely two years after his visit to Harewood, Fenton gave up photography. It was announced in October 1862 that all his camera equipment and large format negatives were for sale. Over 11 years, taking nearly 2,000 photographs, Fenton had wanted to elevate his medium of expression to the point where it could be accepted as an art form. But this life's work was coming under threat because by the 1860s, photography was not so much concerned with art, but with commerce. <laughs> Evidence for a boom in commercial photography could be found on every high street, like here in Lewis, East Sussex, where Edward Reeves opened for business in 1855. For Reeves and others, the wet plate process had made photography a sound economic proposition. And as prices dropped, for the very first time in history, people of even a modest income could afford to own a portrait of themselves. 
To cope with the demand, Edward built a glass studio at the back of his shop. His great-great-grandson, Tom, still works here. With Tom, I found out what it was like to be photographed Victorian style. Of course, I was suitably dressed for the occasion. Pleased to meet you, sir. Would you care to sit for your portrait? I will, sir. (laughs) Why the clamp? Well, in the very early days of photography, exposure times were probably between half a minute and a couple of minutes, which means that in order to get a sharp image, you would have to sit very, very still for that time. Is that why Um, many men in the photographs look grumpy? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, apart from cultural considerations, you can't keep a muscular smile going for that sort of time. You should be able to feel the I can, clamp yeah. in the neck just it as a bit of a steady. It, it's, it's, it shouldn't be too bad. It's a well-to-do Victorian drawing room. The biggest aspidistra in the world. The, I mean, all the props are also there to aid stability, so you can rest your arm on the table, which gives you a little bit more of a brace for the right. long exposures. Was this a nervous time for sitters? Oh, I think it was. Um, the fear of the unknown, I suppose. Um, I mean, the, the process, the collodion process, was based on pretty nasty chemicals, and there would probably be a smell of fairly powerful solvents. You know, it was, it was alcohol and ether and gun cotton and all these things. And some sitters probably didn't really know what was going on. They didn't know if the camera was giving out rays of some sort, you know, some almost aboriginal fear, you might, you might imagine. But it, it was all very much the unknown. It was a, a, an enormous novelty. Yeah. And am I worried about my soul as I sit here? You might well have been. <laughs> I think most Victorians were, yes. Despite this nervousness, the celebrated letter writer, Jane Welsh Carlyle, wrote to a friend... Blessed be the inventor of photography. It has given more positive pleasure to poor, suffering humanity in my time or is like to. This art, by which even the poor can possess of themselves tolerable likenesses of their absent dear ones. Did people want to look really good? I mean, say you make the negative and I'm upset about my broken nose. Can you, can you do something about that? Absolutely. You're using a glass plate of about so big on this camera, which means that you can, you can actually physically retouch it with a pencil or a paintbrush. You can, you can fill in those bags under the eyes, the little wrinkles, mend the broken nose or fill in... You know, it, 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 everything was possible. This sort of commissioned photography was, was commissioned to flatter. Um, no use taking a picture that looked wonderfully realistic but nobody was going to buy. So, um, so, yes, it was all about making people look good. Can you make me look 20 years younger? I'll have a go. <laughs> The image is focused on a ground glass screen at the back, right. so I go under the... So you're going under there to, fo- to focus on me. That's right, yeah. that's right. Under the, bl- under the dark cloth, I can then see you upside down on the ground glass screen. Yeah, very nice. Um, trouble is, that camera doesn't actually work. Um, this one does, so can I take your picture? It seems a sacrilege to do it on digital, <laughs> but let's do it. Oh, got me. <laughs> Excellent. And... Photography was being assimilated into daily life with astonishing speed. A lady Eastlake observed that a photograph could be found in the most sumptuous saloon and the dingiest attic. And it had one most regal fan. There was perhaps no more sumptuous saloon in the land than Osborne House, Queen Victoria's summer residence on the Isle of Wight. From the very beginning of her reign, she was an enthusiastic collector of photographs that filled the rooms of her royal palaces. But the Queen was not only fascinated by looking at photographs, she became the most photographed woman of the century. When facing the camera, the Queen showed both a public and a private face. In May 1857, society photographer Leonida Caldesi was summoned to Osborne House and took this group portrait of Victoria, her husband Prince Albert and nine children.
A photograph like this was either framed or gathered together in a family album, on view only to the Queen and family in her private quarters. But Victoria also understood that photography had a vital role in projecting her public image and that a single photograph could have real power. With Sophie Gordon again, it is fascinating to see in the Royal Collection the kind of photographs the Queen agreed to be released, allowing the Victoria brand to be sold nationwide. In 1860, something fairly momentous in photographic terms occurred. For the first time, the Queen gave permission for a photograph of herself to be released to the public. The photographs were issued in the format known as carte de visite, collected here by the Queen in this album. The carte de visite was a very small photograph, it's about the size of a modern business card, and it's almost always a portrait of someone. And in the late 1850s, the taking of these and the collecting of these by people became a, a craze. Um, people bought them in their hundreds of themselves, their families, but also of celebrities. So she became part of this uh, cartomania, this, this craze for collecting carte de visite. Uh, the Queen herself also collected carte de visite, and she would have her ladies-in-waiting write to the wives of, of well-known men of the time, ask them to send her their portraits so she could put them into her photograph album. The 1860 carte de visites were taken by Regent Street photographer John Mayle. Mayle's photographs of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert are quite surprising, really, because they show a young married couple that it doesn't necessarily suggest that this is a portrait of the Queen and the Prince Consort. There's no regalia, there's no crown or anything to indicate that this is the monarch. Instead, they're dressed in upper middle class costume. And I think that is a very uh, considered and careful presentation of the monarch. It's a way of trying to engage with uh, her population, um, with the people. Um, and perhaps a way of saying, we're just like you, or almost just like you. However, it wasn't long before photography had another function for the Queen. In December 1861, Prince Albert died of typhoid fever. Now this is the morning image by William Bambridge. And can we talk about the detail of this photograph? Yes, it shows Queen Victoria uh, surrounded by some of her children, with a bust of Prince Albert, who had died a few months ago, and she's holding on her lap another image of Prince Albert. And it's a photograph that was subsequently released to the public. Now, many people felt, critics at the time, felt that this was an extraordinary step to take. Mourning was a private act, and that the Queen chose to make this image uh, publicly accessible was almost a, a shocking thing. It was an unseemly display of emotion. But the Queen, I think, is trying to show people the depth of her anguish and her sorrow following the death of her husband. Later in her reign, the impression to be conveyed by her portraits was different again. Sophie shows me this by Alexander Bassano, released to mark her golden jubilee in 1887. It's a photograph that is designed to show a powerful queen. Um, it's a very statuesque image. The queen is wearing an elaborate costume with uh, jewellery and with some uh, insignia as well. And of course, there is the very small crown, which Queen Victoria is particularly known for. And so the image, we look at it and we immediately know that this is the queen and the empress. In the last two decades of, of Queen Victoria's reign, the photographs became increasingly more staid, uh, more formal, um, so carefully composed, and often the negatives as well would have been touched up, the skin would have been smoothed, the curves would have been accentuated. It's a way for the Queen to exert more control, really. Control. I think that's the right word for Victorian portraits, from the Queen downwards. Each an expression of stiff formality in front of the camera. Each a display of good manners, and respectability.
But one photographer questioned all this, bringing a bohemian spirit to British photography. This was Julia Margaret Cameron, who in 1860 arrived with her husband and family to live in Freshwater Bay on the Isle of Wight. They bought two cottages from a local sailor and knocked them into one, naming it Dimbola Lodge, after the coffee plantations they owned in Ceylon. Cameron turned a chicken coop into a studio, a coal shed into a darkroom, and got down to create an extraordinary body of work. Julia Margaret was connected with people of influence, including the first director of what was to become the Victorian Albert Museum, which would buy and show her work. In the V&A library, I met curator Marta Weiss, who began our conversation by showing me an original print of the first photograph that Cameron felt really confident about. Why do you think Cameron called this her first real success? So this is her photograph of a little girl called Annie. She was the daughter of a family who was staying in the Isle of Wight, where Julia Margaret Cameron lived. And Cameron made this photograph in January 1864. She had been given her first camera at Christmas 1863. So this is taken within a month of her receiving her first camera um, as a gift from her daughter and son-in-law. And there's something I find so incredibly modern about this photograph. I think when you look at it, this little girl who was photographed in 1864 could have been photographed in 1934 or in 2004. There's something really timeless about it. Um, and it's also indicative of what um, a sensitive photographer of children Cameron uh, was. There's no particular background. The only strong detail in it is this button. It's one of the things that's in sharpest focus in, in the photograph. Now, who am I to criticize Cameron? But this picture's out of focus. Now, if I was to hand that in at the weekend to the Observer magazine, I'd never get it published. What did people think of it at the time? Cameron's use of focus was controversial in her own time. She claims that she came to the technique um, accidentally, um, but then proceeded to use it on purpose. Um, she said that, you, you know, when other photographers take photographs, they screw the lens on until the image looks sharp. And I just focus it until it looks beautiful. That was her goal. She used the word beauty a lot. And Cameron was very um, consciously trying to make photographs that were works of art. Marta then talked to me about the portrait of a man who connected her to the birth of photography and who first introduced her to the medium, Sir John Herschel. Again, the photograph is quite close. So we see her, her really pioneering the close-up here. Rather than there being any sign of his contemporary clothing, she's chosen to drape him in velvet. He has a dark cap on his head and he's got a dark background. And so with his fluffy um, kind of halo of hair, he seems to just be emerging out of the darkness. Mm -hmm. And this very dramatic use of light and dark is, is typical of Cameron's style. There's something else at play here. Do you think she's searching for a psychological depth in her sitters? Absolutely. She also said that when she photographed people such as Herschel, she actually felt that the process for her was a kind of embodiment of prayer. So she herself is, is in a way, worshipping these, these men in general that she saw as geniuses. And her photographic interaction with them was something very personal, something very intimate. Um, and she really was making an effort to show um, the, the internal as well as the external. Cameron usually took photographs of those she knew. But in this photograph, she used an artist model, a Mrs. Keene, to play a character, Mountain Nymph, Sweet Liberty, after the poem by John Milton. What's really remarkable about this photograph is the way the sitter is confronting us. And Herschel himself was a great admirer of this photograph. And, and he said to Cameron that, that it, it seemed as if the figure was thrusting out of the paper towards us. It's very us. haunting. I'm very mm. haunted by it. 
you know, and you can't ignore it. No. You have a reaction to it. No. And, it, and then you try and work out what's going on. Yes. You know, as you say, is it a piece of theatre or is it a portrait or is it Mrs Keane? By the 1860s, there had emerged a photo establishment holding strong views on proper ways of working. So they hated what Cameron was doing. Her work was absolutely attacked by critics. They accused Cameron of slovenly manipulation, um, not only of her deliberate use of soft focus. There are all sorts of streaks and smudges and bits of dust and so on that are apparent in Cameron's photographs. Today, I think we can appreciate those as uh, traces of the artist's hand, but to her photographic contemporaries, these were just signs of incompetence and carelessness. And um, I also think that there was a sexist element to the uh, critical attacks on her, that here, you know, how, how dare a woman come along and, and try and um, make a name for herself in photography. Undeterred by the attacks, Julia Margaret Cameron continued to take photographs. Then, 11 years after the first success of Annie, she and her husband left their Isla White home to go back to the family estate in Salon. With them, on the voyage, went her photographic equipment, but also two coffins, in readiness for their deaths. She died in 1879. But photography was not only involved with the serious-minded ideas of artistic beauty, further technical improvement allowed the sheer fun of life to be pictured too. In 1892, amateur photographer Paul Martin came here to Great Yarmouth. He was by trade a wood engraver, creating illustrations for newspapers and magazines, often as we have seen from photographic images. But on lunch breaks near his London workplace and on holidays, Martin always had a camera with him and he was greatly helped by the arrival of dry plate photography. As a photographer, I love this old language. Snapshot plates, the best possible plates for rapid hand camera work and all extremely quick exposures. And this great line, to be opened only in dull ruby light. Now here we have them. These are called dry plates. These made photographers' lives so much easier. You bought them ready-made. You took your picture, then you took them home and processed at your leisure. No more dragging around the portable darkroom and those horrible smelly chemicals. Dry plates also led to the use of portable cameras like this. This dry plate photography led to even quicker exposures of a second or less. You now needed a mechanical aid to control light entering the camera. So the shutter was introduced. And quicker exposures also meant you no longer needed a tripod. And as a consequence, cameras became smaller and handheld. With this new technology, Paul Martin was able to take a new kind of photograph, the snapshot. Before, photography was a self-conscious exercise, everything rigorously staged and composed. Now, a photographer like Martin was liberated to be so much more spontaneous and instinctive in his picture-taking. But this in turn demanded that snappers learn the discipline of waiting for the right shot. It appears that Paul Martin had just the right temperament and the patience to wait for what the great French photographer Cartier-Bresson called the decisive moment. Look again at Martin's photographs and you can appreciate this. But as the Victorian age came to a close, photography witnessed not only what was being gained, but also what was being lost.
Only miles inland from the Norfolk coast, the photographer set about recording a way of life he feared was under threat. And in doing so, he would create some of the most beautiful photographic images yet seen. His name was Peter Henry Emerson, heir to a fortune made from sugar plantations in Cuba and a trained physician. Emerson loved to sail his traditional wherry boat on the rivers and inlets of the Norfolk Broads. And this gave him an intimate knowledge of the land and the people who worked the water and the marshes. In 1886, Emerson collaborated with the artist T.F. Goodall to produce a book, Life and Landscape on the Norfolk Broads. In his pages are lovely, painterly, impressionistic photographs. Many of these are portrayals of men and women in a variety of traditional working practices described in their titles, like this one, Ricking the Reed. Poling the Marsh Hay. And Gunner Working Up to Fowl. To find out about the man and his work, I took a boat trip in the company of his great-grandson, Stephen Hyde, himself a professional photographer. Moored up, I asked Stephen about a couple of photographs that offer up deeper meanings on closer inspection. Tell us about this photograph. At first sight, this photograph is just a classic Emerson, beautiful photograph, and it's entitled The Old Order and the New. And at first you might wonder why it's called that, because it, to our eyes it seems like all the old order. And if you look carefully right to the left-hand side of the photograph, you see an old derelict windmill. Now these mills were used for draining the marshes to make the land, to reclaim the land, make it more sort of profitable. And next to it is the new modern version of the same thing, which is a steam-driven mill. And that's with the smoke coming out. And to Emerson, this was a key sort of symbol of what, how life was changing. And actually, how, how he was threatened. Absolutely. And he knew that this way of life was, was disappearing. And the steam mill here is just one symbol of the new world and what he knew was going to sort of take over from now on. One seemingly idyllic image gathering water lilies, we now know as another portrait of working life, thanks to the research of writer John Taylor. There's a story behind this photograph, isn't there? Absolutely. The lady's not just leaning over to pick a lovely flower which she happened to see. They would harvest the water lilies and use them as a bait and a lure for catching tench. They'd put them in bow nets, big round bow nets, and they would then lower the bow nets into the water and the tench would see the water lilies and be attracted to them and swim into the nets. We know that the lady picking up the water lily is his good friend and collaborator, T.F. Goodall, the artist. It's his fiancé and the man in the boat is her father. And so they planned this meticulously. So I think this is one of his more successful works where he's managed to make a photograph rather than take a photograph, but do it in a, such a way that it actually looks totally genuine and just like a, somebody's swiveled round, seen the scene and gone click, where it's not that at all. As well as being a skilled practitioner, Emerson had strong views on photography, how it should be done and what it was for. He had intellectual discussions the whole time. He wrote a thick book, and one of his great thoughts was that focus should not be sharp all the way through. And he called this naturalistic photography. There were people around at the time who have said, look how good my camera is, I can get every leaf perfectly sharp. Well, for him, that was the antithesis of what you should do. You should see the camera, the photograph should see what the human eye sees. So as I look at you, the, the trees over there go slightly fuzzy. Your eye is travelling through the photograph. Absolutely. Yeah. Whatever his theorising, and it was often contradictory, what remains for me are Emerson's photographs. 
each one a stunning historical record that confirms that by the century's end, the camera had become the preeminent way to memorialise the national story. To end this episode, I've gone from Norfolk back to Wiltshire and Laycock Abbey, where I began. On reflection, and what impresses me most, is how far photography had travelled in the 60 years since that first experiment by Fox Talbot, here by this window. And I'm left inspired, but also humbled, because the early pioneers of my trade did so much during such poignantly short working lives. From this in 1835 to this in 1886, it's a remarkable achievement. Has any other art practice matured so quickly and with such confidence? Yet this was just the beginning as a new century beckoned. Next on Britain in Focus, the photograph makes newspapers and magazines mediums for seeing as well as reading. Photographers try to find a way of recording the horror of 20th century genocide. The artistry of Alvin Langdon Coburn and the glittering world of Cecil Beaton. People take pictures of each other